Shortly after dusk on a mid-May evening in 1943, 19 Lancaster bombers, each carrying a top-secret weapon, left their home airfield and headed for occupied Europe. Flying at 200 miles per hour at treetop height across enemy territory, they approached the heavily defended Roar Valley. Their targets that night were thought untouchable, but in perhaps one of the most daring aerial raids of the entire Second World War, they would achieve the impossible. For many, it will be a one-way trip. But all who took to the air that night would earn their place in history as the Dam Busters. By early 1943, the tide of war was finally beginning to turn in favour of the Allies. In the east, the German 6th Army was under pressure from the huge Soviet offensive around Stalingrad, and in North Africa, Rommel was on the retreat as the advancing Allies forced him from the continent. That said, the Germans still controlled huge swathes of mainland Europe and her industrial output was higher than ever. The heart of that industrial might was to be found right here, in the Ruhr Valley. The valley itself was absolutely vital to German war production in 1943, made so predominantly by water. The mighty Ruhr River had been dammed in multiple places throughout the valley, harnessed to be used for hydroelectric power stations, predominantly for use in the steelmaking process in German war production. The presence of major coal deposits nearby and the vital waterways and canals connected to the river also allowed movement of raw materials and finished goods across Germany. This made the area perfect for industry, and many factories had sprung up in the area as a result. Five major dams served the valley, namely the Myrna, Sorpa, Lister, Ennepa and Henna, which together contained 254 million tonnes of water. The most important of these were the Myrna, a 2,100 foot long, 140 foot high limestone rubble dam which was more than 100 feet thick at the base, and the Sorpa, Completed just four years before the outbreak of war and constructed with a concrete core, it measured a little under 2,000 feet and stood 190 feet high. Between them, they accounted for three quarters of the Roar's stored water capacity. In addition, two other important dams existed in the area, the Ada and the Daimel. Not serving the Roar directly, they were nevertheless vital to maintain movement up and down the attached canals and waterways. The Ada particularly was seen as a key target. It held back some 200 million tonnes of water from cascading down into the valley below, which contained four hydroelectric power stations and a large aircraft manufacturing district in the town of Kassel, some 35 miles away. Unsurprisingly, the importance of the Royal Valley was well known to the Allies, and from March to July 1943, the Royal Air Force would launch a five-month campaign of more than 40 large-scale raids on the Ruhr dropping 34,000 tonnes of bombs, with a loss of more than 5,000 aircrew. The issue though, as far as Allied planners saw it, was that not one of those conventional bombs would have any hope of breaching the dams and putting the entire region out of action. Enter Barnes Wallace. A renowned aeronautical engineer with the Vickers Armstrong Company, he was approached with the problem of how to breach the dams and after much experimentation on scale models and then on British dams, he found that rather than a single bomb as originally envisaged, a smaller charge placed directly in contact with the dam could be highly effective. The result was two bouncing bombs known as Highball and the much larger Upkeep. Although Wallace himself always referred to upkeep as a mine, it was actually a cylindrical steel drum containing 6,600 pounds of RDX, a new and powerful explosive which would be detonated by three hydrostatic pistols set to trigger at a predetermined depth of water. In essence, upkeep was a large depth charge. But the real innovation was to be found in the manner of delivery. No existing aircraft in the RAF arsenal could carry such a weapon in 1943 and so Wallace designed a series of modifications which allowed the famous Lancaster bomber to carry the bomb, slung beneath the main bomb bay and crucially powered by a hydraulic motor. It was this motor which held the secret to the bomb, backspin. By rotating the bomb in the air at a speed of 500 RPM, it achieved three purposes. One, it created lift slowing its descent down once released. Secondly, when hitting the water, the spin allowed it to skip along the surface rather than dig in and sink. And finally, upon hitting the dam, the backspin would cause it to get pulled back into contact with the dam and remain there as it sunk to the depth set for detonation. 
The concept itself makes sense and with hindsight was a very good idea, but it's fair to say that not everyone was so enthusiastic at the time, as Air Chief Marshal Arthur Bomber Harris proved when first told of the project. This is tripe of the wildest description. There are so many ifs and ands that there is not the smallest chance of it working. To begin with, the bomb would have to be perfectly balanced around its axis. Otherwise, rotation of 500 RPM would wreck the aircraft or tear the bomb loose. I don't believe a word of its supposed ballistics on the surface. It would be much easier to design a scale bomb to run on the surface, burst its nose on contact, sink and explode. The bomb would, of course, be heavier than water and exactly fit existing bomb bays. At all costs, stop putting aside Lancasters and reducing our bombing effort on this wild goose chase. Let them prove the practicality of this weapon first. The war will be over before it ever works, and it never will. Despite Harris's misgivings, Wallace was given the go-ahead to start work on the 26th of February 1943, and testing began almost immediately. This remarkable footage, shot during top-secret testing of upkeep and highball, gives us a good idea of how the experimentation took place and of just how precise the crews needed to be in order to maintain both line and length to target. For the dam's raid though, it was decided a new heavy bomber unit would be created for the purpose, the famous 617 Squadron. Unlike the popular myth, not all were highly experienced airmen. Instead, crews were selected for their press-on spirit, simply a determination to get the job done. Leading this new squadron would be this man, 24-year-old Wing Commander Guy Gibson. Having operated since the very start of the war, he was, despite his young age, a highly experienced veteran by the time, having conducted 68 bomber sorties and being awarded the DSO and bar and the DFC and bar in the process. Although Gibson was told of the targets, his crews were not, and initially they were only told that they had to train to navigate accurately by moonlight alone and make a final approach to a target at a height of 100 feet and speed of 240 miles per hour. He did add though the postscript, it will be convenient to practice this over water. The dropping of upkeep itself had to be extremely precise, any small error in the mission would fail. The two key parameters were height and range. To put it simply, standard altimeters were not accurate enough at low levels to identify the exact height required for release, so a simple but ingenious method was devised. By placing two spotlights on the underside of the aircraft fuselage at a set distance apart, the bomb aimer would wait until the two beams met at a precise set height of 60 feet to determine their altitude. The second, and more important, was range. This too was a simple but effective fix. Each bomb had to be released at a distance of 425 yards from the dam wall. Again, bomb sites were not good at this short range, so basic triangulation was used. By using tape on the front blister of the bomb aimer's position and a piece of string pulled back to the aimer's nose, he would line up two set marks with the towers at each end of the dam at a known distance to achieve the correct release range. Crude, but effective. Training continued apace, with crews even flying daylight missions with blue filter paper over the aircraft and special lenses on their goggles to simulate moonlight flying. Practice made perfect, and by the 16th of May the crews were ready. It was just a few hours later at their home base of Scampton, seen here as it looked in 1945, that the 19 crews were finally told of their destination. The route was something like this. The squadron would be divided into three main waves. The first wave of nine aircraft in three sections at 10 minute intervals would take a southern route to the target and attack the Myrna Dam until it was seen to be breached. When achieved, any remaining aircraft would attack the Ada Dam. If that too was successful, then the Sorpa would also be attacked. The second wave of five aircraft would take a different northern route directly for the Sorpa. The remaining five aircraft would form the Airborne Reserve, also taking the southern route, but later than the others. They would be called in if required. And so, at 9.28pm on the 16th of May, the first Lancasters left the runway here at Scampton and began their journey towards their targets. Soon after crossing the channel, the first problems were encountered. The second wave in the northern route came under heavy anti-aircraft fire, with Flight Lieutenant Munro's aircraft taking a flak shell in the fuselage which knocked out all communications, forcing it to return for home. A second Lancaster, that of Flight Lieutenant Byers, was less fortunate. 
slightly off course, he overflew the defences of Texel and was also hit by flak and fell blazing into the Izmir with the loss of all on board. Nine minutes later, pilot officer Jeff Rice's aircraft in the same wave was rocked as flying too low. He had hit the sea near Aflutsteig, ripping his upkeep from its cradle. Reacting quickly, he pulled up sharply and managed to stay airborne, but almost drowned the rear gunner who was submerged in the water which had flooded the aircraft. He too was forced to turn for home. Gibson's wave on the southern route were more fortunate, reaching the Shelt estuary undetected. But we're now faced with a nighttime 200 mile journey at 180 miles per hour and a height of just 100 feet with unseen obstacles and hills all around. Continuing on, they managed to reach their various waypoints and make those crucial turns with no loss until just west of the town of Rees, where they began skirting the formidable defences of the Roar. It was here that the next casualties were sustained, witnessed by the occupant of a local farm. There was a loud bang. Thereupon we left the house basement in Haldenherken and saw that the field in front of us was blaze. A plane flying from a westerly direction had struck the top of a high voltage pole of a 100,000 volt line and crashed into the field. All crew members of the aircraft had been killed, burned beyond all recognition. There were no anti-aircraft positions and searchlights here. The plane had simply flown too low. The first detachment to stand guard at the crash site showed us the valuable finds such as wallets, gold rings, watches and a large electric torch. On the latter, all sorties undertaken by its owner had been engraved, 32 in number. From this sortie, the owner did not return. Moments later, a similar fate befell Flight Lieutenant Bill Astle and his crew, it too being witnessed from the ground. First of all, a four-engined aircraft came from the side over the neighbors' houses. One or two minutes later, a second aircraft came past from the same rest direction but nearer to us. This was followed two minutes later by a third. This one flew into the top of an electricity pylon. It rose a little, flew over our house and crashed 200 meters away in a field. About two minutes after this, a bomb exploded and left a crater so big you could have put a house into it. Seven men were killed in the crash. Despite these early losses, the remainder pushed on, with Gibson's wave of three aircraft also coming under heavy fire, which wounded several in Flight Lieutenant Hopkins aircraft, including himself. Without reporting it, or his shot out engine, he continued on to the Myrna. To really understand just how difficult a task this is, we need to understand the geography a little. Attacking aircraft would approach from this direction, passing over the high point of the Heversberg before descending and inevitably picking up speed. They then also had to slow to the right height, level off, line up, check speed and distance and then release the bomb, hopefully skipping the torpedo nets they didn't know were there, before banking sharply away from the shore and dam. The entire running would last just 15 seconds and that's without even considering the almost point-blank fire they would receive from these six single-barrel Flak 38s defending the dam, each firing upwards of 120 rounds per minute. Circling until most of his aircraft were in sight and coordinating the entire show via VHF radio, Gibson made the first attack run at 28 minutes past midnight. Making a textbook run-in and lining up for the target, he crossed the lake at 112 yards per second and Flight Officer Spafford released his upkeep. With the advantage of surprise, the gunners on the bridge opened fire late as the bomb skipped towards the target, but veering left at the last moment came up short as identified by the explosion 10 seconds later, which shot water 1,000 feet into the air. Forced to wait for five minutes for the waves to subside, next he called in Hopgood. This time the defenders were ready and knew the line of attack. Hopgood, already wounded and on three engines, made his approach. Riddled with flak, his inner port engine set alight along with his wing tanks. Releasing his bomb a fraction too late, it bounced over the dam to explode beyond. But critically damaged and on fire, Hopgood now pulled back on the controls in an effort to gain height. One of the two men to survive the incident recalled the next moments. We were hit by flak and we jettisoned the bomb immediately. Since I was in the nose of the aircraft, I couldn't see all that happened. Beneath my feet was the emergency exit, behind me my parachute, which I quickly put on. I opened the hatch and saw fir trees going past very close underneath me. I jumped without a moment's delay, the chute opened and broke my fall. 
the tail wheel of the Lancaster swept past my head and in two or three seconds I was on the ground. Whilst I was still in the air, I saw the Lancaster explode 500 meters away. I had only a few cuts and bruises. Witnessing the fate of Hopgood and his crew, Gibson realised the flak was simply too heavy, so this time, as he called in Flight Lieutenant Martin's aircraft, he flew slightly ahead and to starboard, drawing much of the enemy flyer and engaging the flak with his own guns. It worked. But again, being hit on release, the aircraft veered slightly to the right and the upkeep came up 50 yards short. Circling round yet again, Gibson called squadron leader Ding Young forward, as he again drew the enemy fire, this time from the north. Young released his upkeep with perfect timing and watched as it struck the centre of the dam, sinking in contact. The following plume of water showed a direct hit. The dam held. By now, Gibson's guns had done serious damage to the defenders and it appeared most of the flak had been silenced as Flight Lieutenant David Maltby approached. He too had a clear run. Again, a perfect shot, the familiar plume of water and seemingly no effect. No doubt concerned by the lack of damage, Gibson called in his 6th aircraft, that of Flight Lieutenant Shannon. But as Shannon neared the target and prepared to release, he got a clear view and called across the radio, it's gone. Here's Martin's account of the moment. We clearly saw the water pouring from the murder dam. It was a fantastic sight. It's almost impossible to describe the feelings we had. We were divorced from the results. A great jet of water was shooting through the dam. We saw the water rolling over the land. It was growing and moving faster as it travelled down the valley. In moments, the masonry wall bulged and burst, throwing an enormous wave of water down the valley and leaving a breach 100 yards wide through which 130 million tonnes of water rushed. At 12.56am, the radio message came across the waves signalling success at the first dam. At this time, those aircraft which had released their bombs turned for home, whilst the remainder, still with an upkeep, began the 45-mile journey to the Ada Dam. When they arrived, it was shrouded in mist and was a much harder target to hit. Bounded on both sides by steep hills, the river snaked across the ground, beyond which a 1,300-foot-high hill, the Michelskopf. The approach was in fact so difficult that the Germans had not defended it. It took Shannon no less than six attempts to eventually get his aircraft into the right position, but misjudging by a split second, the upkeep hit the dam too fast and ricocheted over. Squadron leader Maudsley fared little better. His upkeep also hit the dam too hard, exploding on impact and nearly knocking his aircraft out of the sky, but only destroying the parapet. That left only one upkeep, that of pilot officer Les Knight. Modifying his approach after seeing the first two runs, he released a little earlier, a perfect shot. As they overflew the target and pulled up to gain height, the crew watched as if in slow motion the dam gave way before a huge surge of 200 million tonnes began to cascade down the valley to Cassel some 35 miles away. Even today, we can still identify the repaired breach in the Ada, one of relatively few signs of what once took place here. But what of the Sorpa? This was the wave that had suffered badly by enemy fire and now only a single aircraft of the original five was en route to target, that of American Flight Lieutenant Joe McCarthy. The problem here was the approach and the dam itself. Made of an earthwork bank, it was hard to strike face on without skipping off and also the Sorpa had no towers to use as rangefinders which made it very difficult to judge at night and in the mist. McCarthy decided that instead of running in at right angle to the dam, he would run along its length, without backspin, hoping to sink his upkeep alongside the dam. Using his outer engine as a measuring device, he aimed to position it over the centre of the dam and release halfway along. It took him 10 attempts before Johnny Johnson, the bomb aimer, was able to release, but despite a successful detonation, the dam held. With no upkeeps left, it was down to the reserve wave. Receiving news of the destruction of the Myrna and Ada, three aircraft had been allocated to the Sorpa and two to the Enipa. Unknown at the time, one of those first three aircraft, that of pilot officer Burpee, had already been hit by flak and all crew had perished in the crash. That left Flight Sergeants Brown and Anderson en route to the Sorpa, and when Burpee failed to acknowledge, pilot officer Otley was also directed to change target. Like so many others that night, Otley wouldn't make it. Hit by flak near Ham, 
his aircraft crashed into woodland. With Freddy Tease, normally an upper turret gunner who had switched to the rear gunner position at the last minute, being blasted backwards out of the aircraft. Badly burned, he would be found hours later, the only survivor of the crew. Flight Sergeant Brown, like McCarthy before him, saw just how difficult the attack on the dam was. After five abortive attempts, he eventually dropped his upkeep. Again the explosion, again no effect. Of the two remaining aircraft, neither could see well as the mist had descended across the entire region and dawn was fast approaching. Flight Sergeant Townsend had found the Ennepa Dam, but his upkeep came up short and Flight Sergeant Anderson, the last to reach the Sorper, found he could simply not see the target and so reluctantly turned for home. Tragically, the losses were not over for that night. On his way back through the Netherlands, squadron leader Maudsley, who had been so prominent that night, was targeted by flak near Emmerich. Gun layer Johannes Doerwald, who was just 16 at the time, remembered the moment. I still remember the moonlit night from the 16th to the 17th of May very well. Then came the Lancaster ED-937, which was on the return flight. I still remember how she was hit by the tracer ammunition. She crashed here into the field. Seven young crew members were killed. Such a cruel war must not be repeated. The final losses of the raid were that of squadron leader Dingy Young. Having survived two ditchings, hence his nickname, he sadly did not survive the third when his aircraft was hit as it crossed the coast. All on board were lost. All told, 65 crew members failed to return from Operation Chastise, three of whom would later be found alive as prisoners of war. Wing Commander Gibson, who also wouldn't outlive the war, was awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions and 33 other crew members received awards for gallantry. But what did the raid achieve? From a military perspective, the results were significant. 11 factories were destroyed and 114 damaged, resulting in an estimated loss of 60,000 tonnes in steel production, as well as water, gas and electricity supplies to a major industrial area all being badly affected and much transport and communication infrastructure disrupted. Undoubtedly, the events dealt a severe blow to German morale too. And it could be argued that such a small force had achieved a disproportionately large amount. But on the other side of that coin is the human cost. Several villages were obliterated by the walls of water which shattered everything in their path in the Roar Valley. 92 houses were completely destroyed and over 900 damaged and tragically, especially looking back over 80 years, 1,294 inhabitants and 593 foreign workers lost their lives. One final casualty should be added to that sobering list, though his name doesn't appear on any memorial that of Freddy Tees, the sole survivor of his aircraft which came down en route to the Sorpa. Despite his serious burns, Freddy survived captivity and went on to become a barber in later life. When in 1981 the location of his crew's crash site was finally identified, he made the lone trip to visit the site. A few months later this utterly tragic article appeared in the local newspaper. Operation Chastise has always been and will no doubt remain controversial. The aim of this video is not to address those controversies here, but rather to chart those events and if possible to commemorate those on all sides who never got to enjoy the peace they gave so much to achieve. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video, we hope you found it interesting. And if you'd like to see more content like this, then please consider checking out our Patreon page at the link below. It's no overstatement to say that without your support we simply couldn't make these films. And we want to finish with a final thank you to Dr Robert Owen, official historian of the 617 Squadron Association, whose knowledge and passion for the subject is second to none. That's all this time, we'll see you again soon.